Welcome all and sundry. You are listening to the Brain Software Podcast. This is episode 249, direct from the Hypnotic World Epicenter, Toronto, Canada. I'm Chris Thompson, and today, hypnosis and NLP trainer Mike Mandel and I are going to give you the inner secrets of presenting like a pro, so keep watching. Disclaimer, this podcast episode is so important that I'm going to have to say Lucci. So here goes. <clears throat> Lucci. <laughs> Yeah, so how are you tonight? Thanks once again. So I'm using my new presentation skills on you right now, and I'm sure you can tell how awesome I sound, unlike Duder and Eddard with their stupid, greasy, and hopelessly outdated mullets. But I digress. What in hell's half acres ever happened to that laid-back recreational cannabis buzz we used to know and love back in the day up in Meaford? And that. Ah. Uh... <laughs> uh, we are not witches <laughs> so welcome to the studio a man who needs no introduction but here's one anyway he's that crazy banjo playing hypnotic buccaneer Hurrah! a man who has never used an airline vomit bag not once. because he's the keith richards of hypnosis ladies and gentlemen mac mando and he show. Yes. Thanks once again. It's fantastic. To Say be back. his show. It's just, just oh, great. that's funny. I watched funny. the Keith Richards documentary oh. on Netflix the other day. You ought to watch it. It's fantastic. Tom Waits is in it. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Okay. I okay. just put on Tom Waits the other night, and my wife goes, What the hell is this? I go, Well, I admit this song is a bit one of the more weird ones. <laughs> okay. Well, the thing is, well, we're on that, and we are. Remember at the cabin, you, me, and my, yes. Mike, Anthony, and we put on Tom Waits and Rodriguez and these great things, and then you picked up on this thing, any line, you'd repeat it back to me at commentary, so it'd say, wasted and wounded, and you'd say, he's wasted, wasted and wounded. And he's wounded. Yeah. And, the, and I finally said, You were getting really said, irritated. Shut up. You said, well, I thought it was funny. I said, it, it was, was for, for the, the first, first two hours. hours. <laughs> yeah, so I remember that. Songs uh, about commentary. Okay. Yeah, it was a little bit uh, unusual. So today we're gonna we're gonna do a really awesome overview of essentially major skills that this man has developed, Mike Mandel. In case you're listening to the audio only and don't know who I'm gesturing to, over his career as a hypnosis professional, stage presenter, keynote speaker, and also this has carried itself into casual conversations. Yes, it the has. ultimate hypnotic confidence. It's going to be. So useful, so keep listening. In the meantime, we're going to do the three think tank words. We'll do a quick reference to some of the yes. upcoming stuff and where I will give a URL. And I won't <laughs> advance, say yeah, advance warning. Yeah. And then we'll move straight into the content. So let's do it. Um, These are Savo Bukacek's actual think tank words. All right. Sheer, shore, and embellishment. All right, and shear, like a pair of shears, S-H-E-A-R, mm. shear, scissors, but also, okay, let's go with it. So, by the way, the point of these is to see what unconscious, unconscious patterns, minds. ideas come up because they yeah. then fit into the content of what we're about to discuss, yeah. or sometimes they do, like and then we'll just see where it goes because it's yeah. a lot of fun. So, shear is okay. actually a type of force in mechanical engineering. Of course it is. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get things like bar fractures and stuff like that. And yeah. what I find interesting here is shear to me goes to shears, like pruning shears. And right away, I think of Peter Cushing mm -hmm. in a movie called Torture Garden when I was a kid that really freaked me out. And he'd hypnotize people and say, watch the shears. Just stare at the shears. And stare at the shears. Yeah, oh, so my goodness. We're going we're gonna to get hypno -cons yeah. made. We're not going to get hypno shears. All right. So, so we'll, we'll tie those two together. So a shear force is what's used in shears, a.k.a. scissors, to cause <laughs> fracture. So you have a sharp, you have two sharp lines that are extremely close together close together so you have very high pressure right and you have a high Which shear is force actually separating the molecular bond isn't it you're yeah you're basically fracturing through yeah, high pressure yeah. so that's yes. what cutting is that's what Fantastic. shears do so if you think about putting intense force on a very specific point yeah and i can think that's of one what it, that yeah there you go that's the what kitchen. it yeah, yeah that's a sh that's shear so okay. shear is like you can think of it as intense force and that you can causes also see it as hypnotic shears yeah so what about shore sure yeah so it's that tra it's I, obviously i think of uh, about like an ocean waves lapping onto the shore of a beach I'm humming "Stranger on the Shore." I was just waiting Making for you to finish. Like a trumpet. Yeah. I just had to get through the first part. So okay, no, nope, nope, no, that's You're okay. thinking of that's waves okay. on well, the shore. Well, I'm thinking of waves. They crash on the shore. So right. the shore, it, it has a boundary. It is not. It is not one specific line. 
right. it, it has a range and it moves because the shore, you know, you get uh, you get high tide and low tide. Right, right. So it's it's the transition period. So conscious, unconscious, perhaps you could think of all kinds of things. You Is it day can. or night? Is it play or work? OK, now I'm bringing in another one. So I'm seeing shore not so much as a noun, but as a verb. So you mm. can shore oh, something up. Oh, sure. Yeah, sure, like that. You said, sure. sure, you can sure, shore. You can sure. sure, you can shore I something sneeze, up. So I got this. Uh oh, uh oh. This perfectly ordinary tissue ready. Are, are we going to edit this no, no, out? I think we're not. I, I'm, I sneeze really well. My father, I adopted his. All right. It's like, got a, almost a. a Do you ever wreck bone. someone's sneeze when they're about to? You go, I chew. Yeah. And they I, go, I had a friend oh, you wrecked it for me. He used to go, you don't sneeze. You don't sneeze. And you'd stop people. It was horrible. All right. So that moves to our third word, which okay, is. Okay, you go to the third word. I'll go em- Embellishment. Now, embellishment. Hey, oh, there you go. Oh, oh, oh this stuff really comes out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> embellishment. Uh, embellishment. I'm going to embellish that sneeze next time, and by adding even more. Yeah, yeah embellishment is an is a nominalization, right? It is. It's a it's a noun that you can't put in a wheelbarrow. It okay. doesn't have any physical structure to it. So, an embell. What would you think about embellishment? Well, if you're going to shear things out of your life using the force concentrated in a small area, creating a new shoreline of possibility and mm. potentiality, there's no need to embellish it because it's just going to be. Or sometimes you could embellish <sighs> the again. future outcome really embellish it in your mind to draw you forward to make it very appealing with like Ooh, jack the freaking there you forward go. drawer yeah All i right. remember uh i remember when my first boss in my well, not first boss i was working for nortel networks okay. engineer second job as an engineer and my boss had to write performance review and he he wanted to write something nice of course because they're doing yeah. a good job and he hands it to me it's a draft he says feel free to embellish like he wanted my edits on my own performance right. review which i thought was right. funny so there you so, go that's why you're not there anymore <laughs> what a bastard <laughs> I Someone stay- actually chided me lately and said, I, you know, you said bastard in the podcast. Said, yes, oh, we do that a lot. That's a that's a problem. Yeah. I, I say way worse well, than that. I get <laughs> some people, and this is probably a this is probably a consequence of taking these long form long form contents and then snipping off little chunks for social media. Like Karen's okay. been snipping a lot of little snippets yeah. out, and people go, "If that guy would would just stop interrupting Mike." Like, do you realize that we interrupt each other all the time and that's part of the nature anyway? Let's move yeah. on. We're going to do some quick discussion about what's coming up, then right. our content. So we have nearly sold out the Mike Mandel Hypnosis. Uh, sorry, not the Mike Mandel Hypnosis Academy. Duh. No. The Architecture of Hypnosis, our five-day training in May, is almost sold out. Now, we've had a lot of people going, I can't make it in the spring. I'd really like to make it in the fall. So we reached out to the venue and we've already got the dates we nailed have down. The fall dates. We're not opening up registration until just for bad luck. I want the contract signed before we take anyone's yeah, money. Bad luck. But it will Magical be thinking. November 11th through November 15th in Toronto. So that is penciled in. The contract will be signed and then we will take registrations. But in the meantime, we're still taking registrations for, I think it's May 20th. 27, 8, 9, yeah, 27 through 31st. We Monday have a, Friday. We had 10 spots left. By the time this goes live, it'll probably be like two or three, is my guess, at the rate of signups. And we're not, doing, we're not doing, you know, appeal to scarcity. This is, no, no, it's for real. Really we don't fast. like to have more than about 40-ish students in the room. We'll maybe push it a little bit, depending on demand, but we like a tight group of people that we can people. you know when we're having coffee breaks we're talking with everybody and that's stuff right i don't want 200 people in a room no way so that's what's going on we uh we're also going to announce the dates for the next foundations live which is an online eight-week right. training we take you from complete beginner you go through the mike mandel hypnosis academy lessons some of the lessons and then you work with us in online zoom sessions and you practice in small groups and you get really confident at the basic skills that you can then build on after on your own it works really well and that will be in july July next cohort. So check out the website at MikeMandelHypnosis.com. You can go to the events link in the nav and find out more. That's it. And I'll be getting the Wi-Fi. We're trying to figure out the Wi-Fi back up at the cabin. Oh, yeah, you'll have high speed. the great announcement yesterday is really going to help. Did you hear oh, this? No. Bell Canada is laying off 4,800 people. I think that was related to um, media, like journalism and yeah. uh, they whatever. They got that many properties people involved in media? I mean, good grief. Yeah, it's something. To, anyway, it won't have anything to do with cellular right, and so we'll edit that wireless. Out. But you're going to be up at your cabin yeah. with high speed fixed wireless yeah. 5g essentially connected right to your cabin nice. so we'll be doing foundations live with you up in paradise yeah. and it'll be super reliable in yeah. which is great all right let's go on to 
talking okay. about what Let's what is the whole point of this? Why do we want to talk about presentations? There are presentation <laughs> skills that we all need. Mm-hmm. If you want to be more effective dealing with, you know, people at work, if you're asked to make a speech in a boardroom, if you're asked to talk at a wedding or a funeral, God forbid, if you're mm-hmm. doing hypnosis shows, if you're a mm-hmm. keynote speaker or want to be, they are the identical skills. Now, some of them you're not going to need for specific purposes. We're giving you the whole toolbox of a ton of stuff here. Yeah. And you decide which ones you're going to adopt that'll make your speaking engagements better. And guys, I've done this, if you count the keynotes, over 5,000 times. So this is the stuff that has worked for me. Yeah, and the important thing here is <laughs> we could easily have really honed this in on if you're a speaker a paid skeaker. Skeaker. Couldn't couldn't do that. I can clearly not be a paid skeaker. If <laughs> if you're a paid speaker, wonderful. Mike has tons of experience there. But this experience also lends itself perfectly to you've got to give a presentation at work to the to the board of directors or just to your colleagues. Yeah. You've got to show up at a conference and make a 50 minute presentation or even if like Hypno Thoughts Live, you know, 20 minute, 25 minute presentations for the people who are coming the first time. Anybody presenting themselves in where they're an expert, we're going to help you understand how to do that better. And that also lends itself to social situation. So maybe before Uh-oh. we even get started, can you give a bit of a summary as to how these skills as a professional speaker, where you were paid a lot of money, also lend themselves to traditional everyday conversations? Well, it's all the same thing. If you think in terms that you are always making some sort of presentation, anytime you're speaking, anytime you're in front of other people, whether you're sitting on a bus talking to the person beside you, you want to come across, I'm presuming, as the best possible version of you. Mm-hmm. Someone who is interesting, someone who's compelling, someone who listens well, which is one we have, <laughs> we have a little bit of trouble with that one. So we're not perfect yet, and we're not even trying to be. But uh, the bottom line is these skills are useful in any conversational setting, right up to the point of being a presenter in front of huge audiences. And do you know the biggest audience I ever presented to? I was going to tell you this. Um, Guess Hi. Live or on live. TV? On TV live. Oh, wouldn't that be the very first one? No, Australia, yeah, right? It, yeah, it wasn't yeah. live to tape. It was live. Yeah, and it wasn't like a million they people. They said one to four million are watching this show. And right that was, was where like, were you yes. on Australia? I was in Sydney for that. Sydney, yeah. okay. Yeah, holy Fantastic. cow, man. Can you imagine a million people watching you? Amazing. Wow. It's no different than 50. So th- we're going to bring some certain skills to the table here. And let's mm. start with the big chunks. Yeah, okay. okay. So I'm getting this from Aristotle. This is going back to the Greeks. They figured out logic. They figured out all of the devices of rhetoric, of persuasion, and being a dynamic speaker and so on. And Aristotle divided it into three different things, which are logos, not logos, logos, ethos, and pathos. And these three things, if you put them into what you're doing, they make you extremely uh, Mm -hmm. powerful presenter and extremely efficient. So the first one is logos, which is the word we get logo from. It's also where we get the word logic. And this provides the logical foundation for everything you're talking about. It has to make sense. So you can't jump around like Jack the frickin' round jumper. You have to move logically from large chunks, concepts, down to the fine details and applications. When you do that, people will follow you because it makes sense. You can't talk like one of my relatives in a scattergun approach that's just, oh, now this and now this and all over the map. You have to be logical. So that's the logos part. And we'll be getting to the sequencing of how you yes, should will. present. Okay. All right. So um, then we have ethos, which establishes the speaker's ethic. Ethicness, ethicality, 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 ethicalizationalism. Ethic- <laughs> behind it. Yeah. So ethos uh, shows that you're ethical, which gives you credibility. Ethos draws from sources that are recognized. All the things that build credibility mm-hmm. as far as using, uh, bringing things to the table that are useful and powerful and ethical. So used car salesman. Aristotle. Different ends of the spectrum, let's say. I didn't say that. So when the lawsuits begin, I mean, I, he's using yeah. his law firm. I mean the mine. the typical. <laughs> view of a slimy defense. used car salesman, oh, or this. or you can think about uh, a TV speech. show like uh, Breaking show. Bad, Saul <laughs> Saul Goodman, okay. you know the slimy yes, lawyer. Yes, that's yeah, right. well, good point. And pathos. Finally, when we get, we get the word, <laughs> yeah, you have the word yeah. pathetic comes from that. So pathos connects the audience 
with emotions. So mm. you're engaging the emotions of the audience, which is extremely powerful. We know how boring it is if someone talks in a monotone and never gets to the point or makes okay. it interesting. They want to drive your thumbs into their eye sockets. So actually, right, so. right there, Can we you? have we have three we have a, an important summary of three points, right? So you need to be logical and it have a sequence sense. and make yep. sense. You have to be seen as ethical yep. and authoritative, I suppose, yes, would go along with that. Fits into that. And you have to use emotions, which now is a good time to mention why this ties in with hypnosis. Well, as our friend Freddie Jacqueline says, and remind me to tell you about him later, I had to send him a, a special note. Oh, okay. We'll talk about this. But Freddie Jacqueline, our friend, an amazing trainer, he says, Engage the emotions or create an emotion and give a suggestion. It's a nice, when simple way to When people are emotional, we can get in hypnotically very quickly. Right. So uh, hypnosis, even if you don't think about hypnosis, something that you do on purpose, it's a naturally occurring thing where emotions happen. I was actually thinking about this the other day Uh-oh. where let's say you're watching a scary movie, okay? Yeah. And so you have emotions because you're watching this scary scene and what is the response? The idiodynamic response might be tense up all my muscles sure, or, yeah. or hold my breath perhaps, right? Nobody gave me that suggestion. That was an unconscious behavior that happened. Unconscious response. But if yeah. you have an emotion, either there's going to be an unconscious reaction to it, phys- physical, like physiological change, right. or someone could offer a suggestion. So when you're using hypnosis on someone else, you're offering suggestions and giving directions Whereas if it's just happening naturally, no one's suggesting anything to you. You're just unconsciously responding to the emotion that you're feeling. I know that's interesting <clears throat> because um, the emotional thing, I've told you this before. Remember when I was in high school, this is out of the late 60s, early 70s. <laughs> this is going to be good. It was a good. experimental time. Okay. And uh, I had a friend over at our place. We had a party and I had a dresser that had a glass top on it. And he was in the other room and this guy was like Dave Ambrose, he was right out of the line, oh, yeah, seeing see right. Paisley's in the air and stuff. Yeah. And I poured some aftershave on the on the top of this dresser. And he came in, I called him, and he walks in, like, just trying to figure out what's going on. And I got a wooden match, lit it, and I threw it. And, oh. it stayed lit, and my dresser burst into flames. He goes into shock, like, <gasps> like this. And I used the emotion, and I said, cops. And he looks at me and smiles, <laughs> I said, cops. And he's like... Immediately went on a freaking bad That's trip. That's so funny. Cops. Isn't that and weird? I didn't even know it, and I was already creating the technique. Cops. That is so weird. And he looks at me like this. He goes, cops. And he... <laughs> I was 17. Let me off the hook. So he had no idea there was a no, glass no. barrier protecting the wood. Just oh my goodness. That, you so, never told me that. That's, that's a great one. Do you want to be an excellent presenter? Um, why? What's the point? Well, it's a leadership trait, first of all. Excellent presenters like Alexander the Great, who I think at age 26 bemoaned the fact that he had no more of the world to conquer. It's like this guy was a leader that anybody would follow. Yeah. He was excellent. I mean, you just have to watch Kenneth Branagh. Even though he had no lips... Kenneth Branagh was an excellent Shakespearean actor, or I guess he's still alive. A friend of mine went to school with him, Paul Giles did. Oh, and no Kenneth way. Branagh in Henry V, he makes the same Crispin's Day speech. You want to see the use of um, rhetoric, the use of power in using words to sway people. Watch it. I watch that, and I just want to go out and join an army and take bows and arrows over to France <laughs> right away. The St. <laughs> Crispin's Day <laughs> Battle of Agincourt speech, Henry V. Watch it. You can probably find it on YouTube. It's amazing. Now, it's a leadership trait. But we all want to be more influential. Why? If we're less influential, people are influencing us. Well, leadership implies that you're influential right. because Pete, what are what are you if you're not a leader? You're a follower. People follow leaders, right? People follow you on social media. So by right. being a leader, you are it's influential. You. Yeah. And that's the thing. You know, if people think they're a leader, you, you check, look behind you and see if anybody's mm-hmm. following you. That's how you know. And whoever follows someone that doesn't communicate in a way that evokes some emotional response. Nobody. We follow based on the emotions that we feel. Right. right. And I mentioned the example before mm-hmm. Fidel Castro, the reporter who watched him in standing the rain, in the rain for and four Castro hours. Was being, he realized he'd been standing there for four hours. It was yeah. so hypnotic. He was so drawn into what he was saying. Yeah. And that is Don't not a, that Castro is not a, a dick, judgment on no, the quality Castro of Castro really as a person. No. But, yeah. Right. It's a statement about the quality of how he communicated. <laughs> now, it, yeah. if you are an excellent presenter, this will make you more effective as a communicator, which immediately makes me think of David Steinberg, the comic, mm. when he's playing the part of a psychiatrist and someone comes into his office. He's, what can I help you with today? And he said, 
I have trouble communicating with people. And he looks at me and says, I don't, I don't know understand. what you mean. <laughs> I don't know what you mean. He's so poor at it. So anyway, the greatest world leaders have these skills. They, they have to. Mm-hmm. Listen to Churchill's wartime speeches. Uh, Barack Obama, whatever you think of these people's politics, he was a superb communicator, mm-hmm. an excellent speaker. He had such a relaxed offhand manner. Yeah. Oh, by the way, you, you probably haven't seen this yet, but... Um, and again, this is not a this is not a political statement or anything like that. Yeah, we're, it's just we're as, Switzerland. It's, we're it's neutral. just interesting. But so in the United States, uh, Tucker Carlson. We're in Canada, so we don't always follow U.S. stuff that much. But Tucker Carlson flew to Moscow, Moscow, it, Moscow. Moscow. Thank you, Moscow. Ding. And interviewed Vladimir Putin. Oh, I Two he going, hour yeah. interview. He just posted it on X. I didn't even know he spoke Russian. Which is the old Twitter. Yeah, and I guess Vladimir Putin's got a thing in his ear, and Tucker's got a thing in his ear, and there's there's real time translation going. He's done this before with the new president of Argentina. That was a really interesting interview, talking about economics and oh, yeah, yeah. libertarianism, and right. very fascinating to listen to these guys speak. Anyway, Putin goes on for about a half an hour. And this is, people were commenting on this on how surprised they were at this guy's knowledge of history. Again, quality of person, I don't know. I haven't finished watching the darn interview I've never yet. hung out with him. But a half an hour, this guy goes on, and he's so interesting talking about the history from the 800s through to modern day, all the history of the formation of the USSR and Ukraine and this and that. Again, I, I have no judgment or anything. I'm just learning by well, listening. Polish, so it's an interesting thing to listen to. Yeah. But that was a compelling presentation. And people are commenting on it going, I had no idea. That's very interesting. Again, judgment aside, don't know anything right. about and the he's guy. saying judgment aside because, I mean, we For really real. are, we are apolitical. Mm. And I had a teacher once who said, nobody's apolitical. I said, I am. I, I just don't care. I figure <laughs> you lose one set of jokers, mm. you get another set. No matter what you vote for, a bag of money changes hands. And <laughs> just, Yeah, but if you, you want, if you want to observe how does this guy communicate, it's worth watching Correct. to see that. So let's get right. into the content. Yeah. <clears throat> Where does this apply? If you're doing any presentations to a large group mm-hmm. on a stage or on a platform, perhaps. And we've said weddings, funerals, keynotes, all of these are situations where you are engaging traits that you have in your personality you're presenting a larger than life version of yourself Mm -hmm. and you're getting across to people because you're communicating in a a very interesting and dynamic way and best of all uh you if you have impromptu skills uh, we always say that if you take any kind of improv class i did theater sports and i was in um, you know, I took the Second City training and so on. But what that does, even if you just take one improv class, is it gives you the confidence to not be afraid of looking stupid. Think on your feet yeah, think and on learn. Your feet. Yeah. We would start theater sports. They get someone to loosen everybody up and say, okay, everybody, we're going to make you feel so you're going to look stupid right away. Everybody walk around quacking like a duck. <laughs> and then everybody has to do all this. So you look stupid right from the beginning. And, and you, So you actually look stupid if you don't do it because everyone else is doing it. <laughs> Social compliance. Yeah. But things like that are very helpful. Yeah, I agree with that. But here's a list of some of the most important skills you can have if you're making any kind of presentation. So first of all, preparation. Make sure you know your material. We had one speaker when I was with Speaker Spotlight, great company. Martin Perlmuter got me some stellar work. He really uh, supported me. And the whole organization is just the best speakers bureau I've ever worked with. And now that I'm retired, I don't. But what they did was, uh, Martin was telling me once over lunch, he said he met this guy. A guy came in. He wanted them to book him. Mm-hmm. And he said, what do you speak on? You know what the guy said? Anything. Anything at all. Any uh-huh. topic you want. Bang. He's gone. Yeah. You're, he's a dilettante. You he's, can't claim to be an expert at anything. Yeah. yeah. He's a dilettante. And uh, that, that's the problem. So you have to get your expertise. Decide what you're going to know inside out. And making sure that you know it well enough that you can field questions on it. And you communicate about communication. Exactly. Ah, there uh, we go. So How meta. meta. Yeah. So meta. And especially if there's going to be Q&A afterward. Now, remember, Q&A can be casual. If I, I gave a keynote once in uh, Quebec City, mm-hmm. and there was a psychologist in the group, and he thought I was a psychologist for some reason, educational psychologist. I said, no, I'm a hypnotist. And we talked at this cocktail party afterwards. But I had to be able to answer his legitimate questions yeah. about the things I was oh, teaching. It's like, the most informal source? The most informal Q&A in the world is social situation. Oh, what do you do? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm a hypnotist. Oh, 
Now you've opened the door to the conversation, unless you say something else and right. don't say you're a hypnotist. <laughs> yeah, I'm, an assassin. <clears throat> I'm a drug dealer. Yeah, or yeah. whatever you want to say. You but heard of yeah, it? Yeah, folks. if you if you say I'm a hypnotist, now people are going to ask you about it. You better have some fundamental that logos that you mentioned. You yeah. better have some information and be able to logically structure it. Right. And you have to have the ethos, which mm -hmm. is then showing why you have credibility, why you have that authority, what, yeah. what, what's gone before you. So that's good. It's um, and direct questions. Uh, if you're given questions on your topic, and this is sort of a sideline, you need the big funnels. You need to know what they are, like the practice of hypnosis, mm -hmm. the history of hypnosis, whatever it is. So if they ask you a question, you can direct it into that funnel. Yeah, we'll call it the pillars, like the th maybe three fundamental pillars of this thing that you can talk about right and we don't need to say what they are no 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 no. because we don't even know. well it's it's up to you what <laughs> right, you did what is your decide. area of expertise if your expertise is physics well and maybe you got newtonian physics you got quantum physics and whatever else i don't know but there are going to be different things for different people's topics yes definitely now what we like to do is get into the very same state to practice your delivery as when you're in that situation. Get in the zone. Get in the zone. Right. And we think it's important to relax <clears throat> when you're getting in the zone. If you're tense, it's really, really bad. When I wrote a keynote that I gave in Las Vegas at HypnoThoughts Live in 2019, some of you heard me mention this, I was very happy with that. But I prepared it with no notes by just walking in a very relaxed state in the zone and just gently speaking it out loud. And I was in nature right. when I did it. And I just, I felt very relaxed, very comfortable, very creative. The same way you'd be, the <laughs> same way you would be up on that stage yeah. at the hotel very artistic walking and yeah. delivering your presentation not pacing back and forth That's which it. we'll get so to you're not going to you're not going to nail a, a pre um preset talk by sitting in a desk and making notes you have to be up on your feet you've got to be moving and gesturing and all these things mm. but we'll get to that so Get an introduction. If you're doing something sort of formal, you're not just asked to speak. Oh, could you stand up, yeah, Dave, and yeah. talk about Somebody this? asks you a question. Oh, hi. This is my friend, Mike Mandel. I would like to introduce him to you. As, yeah. No, it's not going to happen. But if in a professional you, speaking you're, you're situation. In the boardroom. Yeah, and the yeah. boss says, uh, Dave, could you just tell everybody what the new sales plan is for 2014? Okay, you stand up. And you say, I'd just like you to read this aloud. Hand me an introduction. <laughs> you this get is your Dave. Boss. He's worked with us for two weeks and probably won't be here much longer because he's a jerk. Anyway, but that's it. If, you are, if you're doing something formal, get an intro. It's important. But don't make it a freaking resume or a biography. This happened yeah. to me once, and it was terrible. I had a, a, a specific introduction. And one of the keys is the last thing in it is Mike Mandel. That's the last thing they and hear. And somebody else is reading out. this. Just Someone in case this I'm not going to read it about clear. myself. Yeah. But uh, I got I got to a thing, you know, back in the 70s. Yeah. I said, I, I need you to give me an intro before I had them written out. And the guy said, oh, we don't do introductions here. I said, you've just started. Yeah. It's like, you, you need an intro. Your name should be last. But what happened was I was at a theater, um, a small dinner theater, doing a great show, nice people. The guy who introduced me made the mistake of not taking the introduction up to the microphone, which is, you know, five lines or something. But he took my freaking biography from the web. Oh my goodness! And he went on for like uh. three minutes and pausing, like, oh, it was it was grueling for me to. It just sounded like I was a, a pompous, arrogant jerk, which I'm not. I pretend to be one really well, but I'm not. And so, yeah, make sure it is it's brief. Now you're how <laughs> just out of curiosity. I guess that you cover you recovered from that by gently making fun of the introduction. I think I said something some like, way. "Well, that's that's a ten minute shorter show I have to do now, or something like that." Yeah. You know? <laughs> I, I often got away with just rolling the eyes. You know, oh. which is always fun. Remember the horrible introduction I had in that high school? The the principal came out of the Catholic high school. Yeah, and she said. He is silent. not, he refuses, not, refuses to come out. He refuses to come out unless you are silent, absolutely yeah. silent. The kids are all wound up, wired, ready for this gig. And then she says, well, you're in for a treat today. First, there was Merlin. I'm going, where is she going? She's not reading the introduction. Then there was Mandrake the Magician. So please welcome Mandel the Magician. Oh, Mike Mandel hypnosis. So you're how did you recover from that one? Do you remember? As I went on stage and she went up, the kids applauded. And I looked at them and looked at the corner at her and just rolled my eyes. And they all laughed. Yeah. She didn't see it. It's like, how do you put up with this freaking person? Anyway, um, so here's the thing. Make sure you got the key points in your intro. And uh, mine was just, it's the different points, just showing the different areas I've worked with. But you're, you've got to be dynamic once they've given you your intro. You've got to hit the stage or the platform or the speaking area with energy right away. And that carries itself to any social situation too, where Absolutely. you don't want to start a, a comment or if somebody asks you a question with, well... 
There was this one time. You know? <laughs> Shut up. I know who you're doing there. That's really, really stressful. What was that again? <laughs> <laughs> so it's really annoying. But uh, it's interesting. You, you have to be, um, I said dynamic. Grab their attention right away. I would always, Martin Perlmuter said that I hit the stage like ACDC. I would sprint onto mm-hmm. the stage. And I was in my 60s. But that's, if you want to seem younger, move faster if you're older. If you want to seem stupid, move really slow and be a dullard. And they'll take you as being that. But the audience will match your energy in any direction. Mm-hmm. That's how our friend, the brilliant uh, rapport builder, Al Pierce, Yes, he has a very calming demeanor when he talks to people, and it just feels good to be in his presence because he speaks slowly, but he's not making a presentation to a group. He's building bridges yeah. with one-on-one or, or two individuals at a time. I think it's important also, you said about high energy and moving, that people will associate slow, low mobility to stupid. Yeah, But it isn't. Stupid. It isn't exactly. stupid. Yeah. You're no. not a stupid person no. if you move slowly. No. But people will naturally think that you're less intelligent. They'll think that if you're moving mm-hmm. slowly, you're thinking slowly. Yeah. And so, I, I mean, I always took my brain drops before I'd gone, as you know. And I'm, yeah. I got some herbal brain drops that put your brain in high gear. All right. So now, get their attention, say, yeah, be congruent, said, and Be actively energy. involved with your audience. Don't see it as, a, as an audience. If you have a big group, I, I got to do things for the teachers in Saskatchewan. It's like in a theater presenting to 3,000 teachers. It was fun. But I still make the point of picking individuals in the audience, looking at them and mm-hmm. talking to them, making eye contact. Speak to individuals, not an amorphous group. Because if you're speaking to an, an amorphous group and you know your material really well, the danger is you'll go on autopilot. You'll just be like a play button, just saying the stuff, just saying it, saying it. And actually, so for people who have any kind of fear or anxiety around, oh my goodness, uh, there's a big crowd. If you make eye contact with one person, have part of your presentation, shift the eye contact, yeah. or hit the microphone to another, person. to another person. It really makes it easier. And you mentioned Jordan, Jordan Peterson, Peterson does, does this yeah, really well. He came to the front of the stage. My wife and I, I think we were front row. We might have been second row. Big Queen Elizabeth Theater and saw him live. And he mm-hmm. actually came right over and he talked right at my wife and I for like 45 seconds. And it's freaky. It's like Jordan Peterson's talking to me. Jordan Peterson's talking to me. Like my friend Willard with his brother Hal. Uh, Willard's got a choke on Hal at a Hoist Gracie seminar. And Hoist Gracie comes over and he sings. And he said, there's Hoist Gracie. Hoist Gracie's talking (laughs) to me. He's talking to me right now. And he's yelling, let him go. He's choking. Oh, sorry. (laughs) Did he do this on on the ground (laughs) after? And he goes, he doesn't need any help. He's waving. He's waving. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah, hit by the propeller on the lake. Oh, he's uh, he's waving. You're floating in the freaking currents. Now, when... (laughs) Eye contact. This <laughs> is going off the rails. Oh, it's um, really okay. enjoyable. Watch out for your gestures. Some are oh, really inappropriate, like this one. Yeah. You, know, you don't want to say three times, ladies. No, there's things that are appropriate. Like in some places, in North America, you can say it was okay. If you do that in other parts of the world, that's an obscene gesture. So yeah, you which have is to be totally culturally strange. appropriate, although mm-hmm. for most of us, it's not going to happen. And then there's just annoying gestures and repetitive gestures, oh, right? So we're, we're talking about the idea of using a gesture so freaking often. And I think when we were talking about this, I said, it's like if the audience can predict that it's about to happen again, it becomes annoying, not interesting. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Do you have some examples of this? I've got one. I remember yeah. Mike Smith, my friend from years ago. I haven't seen him in many years. He's a professor of psychology somewhere now. But he uh, told me that he saw this guy present once, and he was talking all these potentials and possibilities. And he had this repetitive thing he would do. He'd start backing up from the mic at a podium and speaking louder and louder. And then he'd say, but the best, and he'd run to the mic, is yet to come. And how many times and did he, he do it that? Got to the point that he's talking. You see him start backing up. Everyone knows he's going to do it again. Uh, and you're again. just going... Dick, 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 dick. Dick. The other one, I looked at myself because I like seeing myself say that. The other thing is this. Yeah, if gestures are too symmetrical, I saw an astronomer speak once. I won't say where. Very nice man, but that was what he did the whole the whole time. And he also closing off body language too, right? So we're gonna check at the you know sombrero galaxy, and then we're saying that you'll discover that okay. Like a, like a guttural, soft palate noise of someone singing bel canto opera, but without the vocal power. So I, now you all understand me completely. So here's the thing. Avoid endless symmetry. Vary your gestures. Hmm. But watch out. There was this one 
dick I saw once. He had a remote in one hand, and for 20 minutes, he'd just take a step for to the slides, right. For his slides, you mean? Yeah, for his slides. He'd take okay. a step to the right, do this with his hand. Take a step back to the left, do this with his hand. Take a step to the right, do the, this, just his hand to his hip. Over, and he must have done it conservatively 6,000 times. It was so infuriating. But he wasn't as bad as the guy I saw at the Royal York. Remember the glasses boy? Oh, the guy you this told me about. Idiot. He yeah. had this contrived gesture. I think he thought it gave him credibility. He'd grip the corner of his glasses. So he'd make a point and he'd go like that. And they'd talk and he'd go, grab his glasses. <laughs> like over and over and over. Have these people looked at themselves? I'm thinking like if a teenager would make a meme out of this. <laughs> Probably not a good idea. <laughs> Probably not yeah. a good idea. <clears throat> oh, man. You, you got to watch it. Don't be weird. That's one of your best things as a presenter. Don't be freaking weird. Unless you're Carrot Top or something, in which case, it, you know, it's entirely appropriate. Yeah, unless you're paid but to be weird. Unless you're something. paid to be weird. Remember I said I saw that speaker on video? And when I was starting out in 93 during my speaking engagements, my wife said, you should watch some of these other speakers. This guy's this professional speaker. Watch his video. And he just, his entire demeanor changed. He's got his eyes staring. He goes to the front of the stage. He goes... Who are your customers? What are your customers going to think? <laughs> Who are you? That's just bizarre. How are you going to help them? <laughs> the way you're at, the way you're normal? imitating, it also makes me think, <laughs> it's, it's, not a, it's not part of your notes, but right. enunciating your words, you know, instead of or mumbling. Right, but you can, you can do the diction too much. Mm -hmm. If you enunciate too, too, too carefully, yeah. Yeah. It, it, that's just crazy, too. So be normal, only more so. Um, eye contact, I said, is crucial. You're, you you're, talked about the Jordan Peterson example yeah, there that right. makes perfect but, sense. But the audience is best when close. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you guys, after thousands of these, one of the worst things for any speaker or presenter or entertainer is an audience that's mm -hmm. too far away. If I got to a corporate event and they had a freaking dance floor set up later or something in front and the nearest person's 50 feet away, I would... Tell them in advance, fill it with chairs. I want yeah. them almost on the freaking Oh, we stage. do that all the time. When we start the architecture of hypnosis, yep. we show up Monday morning. Timothy and I usually get there early because yeah, I've got to come in from a bit of a yeah. I've got to come in from a bit of a distance. So I make sure I'm there so there's no traffic. But we walk into the room and I go, let's move. We just take the back rows, yeah, three rows, put and put them in the front. Because that's, that's a whole lot easier than Moving sliding all, all of the yeah, chair. But I, it's like, we're, we're going to be up here teaching. And then there's this 20-foot freaking gap between us and the students. Like, no. <laughs> no. Yeah, the reason that's important is even a gap becomes a psychological barrier. Yeah. I was doing a conference years ago, and my wife and I had set up. Everybody had a booth the same with a draped table the same. And she had a brilliant idea. And the way we got so many people come over was all these people, nice people, friends of mine, and the occasional dick. Uh, one, a hypnotist who you know I'm, who I'm referring to. Anyway, um, they would sit down behind their table and people would come over and they'd be sitting casually. You know, here's some of my material. We took the table and put it in the back of the booth yeah. with all the stuff. So I was standing in front of it with the whole them. time. Yeah. yeah. So I'm with them and we can look at the material That makes together. so much sense. And no it's a good reminder yeah. about the idea of seating position just in a conversation too. If you're opposite each other, it's confrontational. If you're beside each other, you're together, right? And ideally at a bit of an angle, which is why eventually yes. I want to get rid of this desk and make yeah, one that has a bit of a V-shape You're an engineer. It. You can yeah. make it in a weekend. Right. We'll, we'll pay you to do yes. it. Yes. Okay. We, we will yeah. pay you to <laughs> now, also, uh, when you're when you're presenting, put some stories in your presentation. Oh, this whether is you're doing critical. Hypnosis, whether you're just uh, presenting at the front, give examples, ideally from your own life, because if they're from your own life, you'll tell them congruently. Mm -hmm. But when you tell stories, it, it, one of the best agents I've ever worked with, Carol Brickenden's retired, lovely woman, and she taught me to do keynotes. She was a freaking expert on them, and she said they will remember the stories. And yeah. I went, wow. Keep it simple. And so when I tell a story. I'm bringing in the whole aspect of ethos, the credibility and authority by crediting the source. I'll say, you know, as so-and-so said in his book, whatever, I'll say the first and last name if I'm quoting somebody to make sure they get the credit, which builds the ethos and builds my credibility mm -hmm. as an ethical person. I notice that when you tell stories, you, you do something that I've never seen others do, which is you, even if it's a story of when I was in grade school and I used to cause my two friends to fight with each other on the way home. Right. You would refer to them not as 
I can't remember their names now. No, Brian McDowell. Brian yeah, McDowell yeah, yeah, yeah. and what was the other one? Well, another guy we won't mention. Okay. This, you but you would mention them. their full names. You wouldn't say Brian and Peter or Tommy and Jonathan. Yeah, Edward you would, and Duder, s- you yeah. would say their full names. And even though no one knows, knows who those news people them. knew, no one, no one knows who those people are. Yeah. Only you do, right? And other people in your lives. But the audience has no clue who these people are. Right. But there's something about using the first name and last name that makes the story more real. Yep. And in my opinion, it gives it more credibility and more interest. Right. And it's like saying, you know, when I worked with a rock star in mm-hmm. Australia in 2004, putting the date in. Yes. It's just that. Mm-hmm. You know, it, that kind of thing. Exactly. So, Be as specific when you can. They actually teach that in marketing, too. If you say something, you know, that like a, here's a client who made X amount of money. You don't say a thousand dollars. You'd say something like one thousand thirteen dollars and forty five cents from impl- whatever it is. The specificity makes it seem more real, and I think that example is you using full names. Specificity is one of my favorite <clears throat> mm-hmm. words. It's I like emerald it's, yes. too. Emerald. It's a very specific word. Now play yeah. the pathos card. Mm-hmm. Engage their emotions. Any emotions. Whether, you know, anger, disgust, whatever, ideally positive emotions. And if you engage other emotions, end with a positive emotion at the end of your talk. Yeah. So everybody feels happy and good and so on. But engaging the emotions is extremely powerful. So we are now going to a quick break. Yes, we're going to go to a quick break because we have to talk about tonight on the Moon Minglewood Network. Fire plugs being blasted, and there's water all around. You pick up your 870 and load another round. The people in the smoke shop won't give the time of day, but still you always shop there on a nasty rainy day. And your blanket smells like motor oil and stains the lonely sheets. There's a figure in the mirror, and he needs something to eat. There's a dresser full of seashells and fireworks from last year. You'll find there's still some makers. Mark, but Jerry drank the beer. So you go on social media, but the server boots you off. And since you've siphoned gasoline, you have a croupy cough. But never mind the school board with their stupid rules and lies. The woman with their fancy skirts and men in paisley ties. You swear one day you'll get away, but sure you're growing old. You lock the keys inside the shack, you're standing in the cold. So I say, Jenny, Jenny, Jenny. Jenny. Jenny, I think it's about time that you force that bastard Jerry to take charge of his life and get a job at the mill where the union's a joke and the grain elevator looks like some kind of primitive phallic symbol and sneak across the tracks near that gap in the fence by the old abitur and see if you can sell those old Bushnell binoculars to Spunk Lucio at the pawn shop and then take the money to the sea secret door behind the STD clinic and creep down the stairs to that specialty shop where Jack, the owner, opens the curtains to the other room and lets you pick up a smooth one for yourself. Jenny and the Smooth One, tonight on the Bloody Harmonica Network. Now let's look at the power of a creative pause. We all... Pause when we speak. <laughs> Scary thing is pause. I wasn't looking at you and I didn't know. That's funny. <laughs> One of the things, when we pause, it stops us from going motor mouth. I gave a presentation, a self-defense presentation mm. with a guy in Britain a number of years ago. It was his first one. So we're, we're teaching like 45 experienced martial artists from all different styles. And we show up there. We're bringing the system over. And he was so adrenaline freaked out. He was talking blah, 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 blah. Okay, we're there. Like, like a million freaking miles an hour. And everyone's looking at him like, what is wrong with this freaking guy? You have to literally speak 10 to 20% slower than you think you should speak. And if you attempt to slow it down 10 to 20%, you'll probably be speaking the right way. Normal. Normally, yeah. yeah you'll but probably. Slow down. And use pauses. Remember, a pause is an underline. It gets people's attention again. And mm-hmm. when you pause and look at them and you gesture to mark the pause, people are just don't do that. The glasses one. People are listening and they're waiting for the resolution of what's coming. Interesting pauses. 
not weird freaking pauses. So <laughs> right. there you and go. And if you go motor mouth, people will know you're nervous. And, and, yes. And never, ever say, well, you know, I don't do many of these. I'm feeling kind of nervous today. Never tell people oh. you're nervous. Don't put it in their mind. Or they'll be looking through their reality tunnel for evidence of that and finding it constantly. Yeah, you don't want to seed a negative suggestion about how you've never talked about this topic or you're uncomfortable or whatever the case yeah, may be. Yeah, that's very, very so, amateurish. motor mouth really can result, uh, can come from, I should say, two things. One, you're not confident and you feel that you need to fill the space. You don't really know where you're going. Or two, maybe not quite as bad, could be worse, is you have too much information. You have no sense of your timing and you think you can't you can't deliver it all. So you're trying right. to no pack it all timing. in right when you should be using the Pareto principle and cutting down, elim eliminate this story or shorten this story or leave this piece of your training out altogether. Like, obviously, this is a podcast. We're going to turn this into a full class. We've had to reduce the amount of material that we can put in this podcast. Well, th there you go. And make sure, too, um, apart from the pausing, make <clears> sure, <throat> as we've said, the whole thing of logos, it must be logical. It must make sense. So mm -hmm. make sure there's a logical flow to what you say, which starts with the big chunks, the premise of what you're going to talk about, the big picture, and then you're going to break it down into the fine <clears> details. <throat> and at the end, it's great to have two sentences just to recap the takeaways for people. Make sure there's at yeah. least one takeaway, mm -hmm. something they can oh, I can pl apply this right away. I remember teaching at the Ontario Police College. I taught their advanced um, interviewing module and a couple of other things. And a guy came up to me afterwards and he said, I could have used this yesterday, this technique. I mean, that's it. Give them a takeaway. Yeah. It's going to make a difference. Your talk must make sense. I'm doing this now. I'm doing the freaking okay. astronomer. Okay. You okay. Must shut up. You must appeal to logos. And don't jump around in what you're saying, unless you're intentionally doing multiple embedded loops, nested loops, in which case right. it is appropriate. Which isn't the same as not making a callback. It's fine to call back to a point you made earlier, but you're not reteaching it. You're just referencing and moving on. Well, reteaching is a, is a danger, and we didn't even discuss this. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine saw a, a noted speaker a while back, and he said, oh, he gave a really good talk. And then he gave it again. And again. <laughs> like, uh, twice. He said he told the whole thing. And then in the recap, he essentially taught it again in, in normal time. Yeah. Like that, that Just crazy stuff. So um, here's another one. Credit your sources, as we've said. If you're quoting someone, make sure you've got it right. This is crucial for maintaining ethos. You can't say something like, it was either say. Albert Einstein or, you know, Dave Dick once said, they're going to wonder which one it was. In fact, you learned this from Aristotle himself, I understand. I did. Yeah, I studied with Aristotle <laughs> just last week. So, you, yeah. Crediting your sources <laughs> is a funny thing, right? Because... People will wonder sometimes, well, if I say that I got it from so-and-so, they'll think it wasn't me. It reduces my power. The no, slightest. it's the it's opposite. It shows you've done your research. You're showing that you're ethical and you're standing on the shoulders of giants. So there's some reason behind what you're saying. There's some credibility to it. Exactly. And you're borrowing that credibility. Borrowing their credibility. Yeah. That's right. Now be congruent. What do we mean by congruent, Chris? We're talking about making sure that your physical body, your emotions, your the way that you present your internal are all monologue or sending yeah. one consistent message, right? right? And you often joke about this and say, you know, imagine walking up on stage and saying, well, this is going to be really interesting. I'm really excited we're, to be we're, here we're today. Gonna have, we're going to have a lot of fun today. It's going to be know. very high energy. Yeah. My voice isn't kicking in to make it even worse. And for what it's worth, I'm actually beginning to annoy And that's myself. annoying. Whereas it'd be more funny to go, this is going to be really boring tonight. <laughs> you got it. I mean, people will know <laughs> that your voice tone is enthusiastic and excited and it's going to be super boring. And they're, they're going to be really influenced by your body language and your tone more than your actual words. 100%. So they're going to carry that energy. So yeah. bring the energy with you. You can be tired later, but even if you're tired, like give them everything. Make your vocal tone powerful. Enunciate clearly. Take your time to speak. Make sure your body language reflects a confident person. Mm -hmm. Stand tall. It's hard for me because of my cervical spine stuff, but I stand as tall as I can and pay for it later. And Give one consistent message so everybody will have this drilled in by your body language, your tone, everything. Right. I say be yourself on stage or on the platform or whenever you're presenting, but more so. 
an amplified yeah. version of yourself. That's Realize right. you're in a way you're acting, right? But if acting somebody like was you. hanging you. out with you in your living room watching a show on Netflix, you're not that same person in that same moment as when you're on stage or when you're talking to a group of people in a social situation, in a business networking situation. Right. If even just me, let's say, hanging out in the hotel when we go to Hypnothoughts Live, in the bar, maybe in the evening or whatever, with a bunch of other hypnotists. I thought you get there eventually. I, I'm not just, you know... Oh, yeah. You no, know, you're just in like chill. I'm like, hey, how you're are you doing? It's good flash. to see you. Networking. I haven't seen you bridges. since last yeah. year. It's how are you know, how are your wife and kids, et cetera, et cetera. We're having a great conversation. Everything's a bit amplified. That's right. Mm -hmm. And remember, too, I, I, I don't know if I put this anywhere, but I'm going to say this. Watch what you say. You know, people can be offended. You never want to use racist or sexist slurs. Any Political. Slurs, anything. No, you stay away from politics. Yeah. Stay away from controversy. Give people stuff they can use. Mm -hmm. And a number of years ago, I was speaking uh, about four really high paying gigs for a, a, an agent in the U.S. had booked me. Mm. It was four of them in Canada. I did two of them. Standing ovation for both of them. They loved it. I did the third one in Victoria, British Columbia. Great place. And was really happy with how it went. About 50 people in this room. And I get a, a message from the agent in the U.S. And he said, oh, they've canceled the fourth one. Yeah, and I, yeah, I remember yeah. this, right? Years ago, you told me about that. Why? What? And the, he said, apparently, you were uh, insensitive to gender. <laughs> and, didn't, and they couldn't find one of the stories you told as being true. I said, well... It happened before the internet was created, first of all, when I went and spoke up in northern, you know, in the north of Canada. Oh, it was the story yeah, about the, the Northwest community. Territories. Yeah, that or, one. Yeah, and it's then, like, um, that was got, in this long time ago. 90s, early yeah. 90s. So it wasn't it wasn't put online. But insensitive to gender. I, I was shocked because I'm very, very careful about this. Of course you are. And I said, well, what did I say or do? He said, oh, we well, don't know. We <laughs> don't know. He said, they won't say. I said, who won't say? He said, the person who's complained. I said, well, can I speak to them to to make this right? He said, oh, no, no. they, they, they want to be anonymous. No, you're so just canceled. I don't know. You're just canceled for something yeah, canceled. that they don't even know why. Yeah, and they wouldn't give me a reason why. So anyway, be careful what you say. I, and I was careful, and still it went off the rails. So <laughs> recognize, um, be yourself, but more so. Uh, you'll, you'll never offend someone by not swearing or using, you know, sexual innuendo or something. Mm -hmm. Stay away from the stuff. Like, just keep it family friendly. And yeah. it's much more powerful for you. And don't copy somebody else's style. Good Here's point. a classic. I knew a guy who was an NLP trainer, a very good one, and a, a pretty good hypnotist, too. And he had just been involved with a lot of Tony Robbins stuff, watching videos, listening to the tapes and everything. It was tapes back then. And he went to do a corporate event. And there was a podium, and of course he wasn't going to use the podium, because I don't use podiums, and neither did he. You want to be out there in front. But the podium was still there where they introduced him. So we went up to it, and... What kind of audience was it, it Mike? Was, it was all accountants, and they're all Enneagram Fives. At least this group seemed to be very quiet and serious and very nice people and very smart. He runs onto the stage, and he's, all right, how's everybody feeling tonight? Turn to the person beside you and say, I'm feeling great! And they're all just like, what is this? And he was smart enough to realize he lost them without even starting. And he brilliantly went to the podium and pointed back to where he had been standing and said, don't you hate presentations like that? And they all, yeah. And he got his credibility back and he, he, he moved Spatially it. Spatially anchored it. So his he anchored error. It. He said, let's put that aside. And here's what we're going to talk about today. And calmed right down and stayed behind the podium and won them over. But yeah, he was he had the sense to notice. He got the feedback from them that yeah. what he was doing was not working. You have to change your mind quickly. Now, I think we need to, um, like, you know, maybe Stop um, the word make, make one more point about what not to do. And we'll tie it into creative pauses. Like, so, okay, you know, yeah, no, yeah, no. So what are we getting to here? Well, word whiskers drive me crazy uh, when people say, so they drive me crazy. Like when you're sitting there and like the person, keep like out of the conversation. It, 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 at least the repetitive like, don't do the, you know, you know, you know, or right. Okay. Right. Or okay. 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 So. Uh, know what I mean? Know what I mean? And these are word whiskers. They get in the way of clear communication and they're said because we don't want to pause. Mm -hmm. Now I'll accept the occasional, um, I mean, there's, that, yeah, reasonable. I consider those 
like uh, filler thing. Yeah, word whiskers, filler phrases, and filler sounds. The um, it's hmm. an old one. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> the guinea pig laugh. Ooh, filler thanks. frown, filler frowns, filler frowns. That's a good one. Filler sounds and filler <laughs> phrases. We want to avoid filler those. Brown. Now we already covered. Yeah. How do you avoid those things? You instead insert those creative and effective pauses. The pauses Use the dead. power of the pause instead of the yeah um right right exactly. And in fact, when you are going to speak to someone, if you have a chance to video yourself or have a friend do it first, do it. And watch yourself. And every time you hear one of these word whiskers, yell it back at yourself on the screen. So if okay. you go, so in there, right? And you go, right! right! And Or if you have a friend who will watch you and do this, this comes from the catcher in the rye. Holden Caulfield talked about in their class when somebody would start to tell a story, it would become a Ken Sweatman story. They started to get off point. If the whole class would yell, digression! And it would turn the person into like a pile of rubble when, rubble when they keep yelling digression, freaking <laughs> him out. Get a friend to do that. Every time you say it right, have them go, right! Or if someone says, you know, you know what I mean? I know what you mean! If they're yelling that at you all the time, you will stop really, really quickly because you're seeing oh, it how man. the audience is seeing it now. It's a whistle. Is it, the, is it the Pink Panther and Inspector Crusoe where he hires the guy to attack him? Yeah, hires Kato. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Man, so man. it's like that, but not physical attack. It's, attack. it's digression. Yeah. Digression. There Beautiful. you go. So you want you want to hire your friends to help you solve that problem. The other way that you can get very good at being comfortable at speaking and using pauses creatively, effectively, without the need to use any kind of ums and ahs and filler phrases, is learn how to use hypnotic language. Learn what we call the run-on sentence. That doesn't right. mean that you have to always freaking do it. But if you master it and you can learn it with the hypnotic language cards and our courses and stuff like that, you'll have the skill to just talk and pause. And no filler phrases will creep into your presentations. That was very well done. Go. Although you did embed the command creep into your presentation. Yeah, creep into your presentation. None of them will creep in. I'm going to reduce really this, this final one to one point instead of the two here. Because okay. Because it just fits better. Shut up. <laughs> Keep it fun for you and them. You want people to, the end of your event, whatever it is, if it's mm. informal or formal, if it's paid or unpaid, it doesn't matter. At the end of it. The secret isn't having them think, boy, he's really smart. He's really good. No, they, you you had a good time. Good. They had a good time. Yeah. That's it. Because people will like you based on how they feel about themselves in your presence, not mm-hmm. how they feel about you. So if you make them feel empowered and that they have all this potential and they're happy, wonderful people and you thank them and thank them warmly and honestly, uh, you'll get a tremendous result with every speaking engagement. You know, yeah. And as we wrap up here, I think that's a really good point to bring to not even just formal presentations, but let's say you're a teacher and the principal of the school says, will you teach this class? And you freaking hate teaching that class. Do you think you're going to come across as a congruent, effective communicator? Probably not. If somebody says to you, Mike, you're going to be at HypnoThoughts. Uh, imagine Scott Sandlin said to you, will you give a presentation, Mike, on pick a topic that would just bore the crap out of you? Social media? Oh, there. well, you're... It's not one that you would be an expert on anyway, I no. suppose. But if you pick a topic that you know you would not enjoy teaching and someone says, oh, will you do that? You should say no. I get, right? So if you asked me to do one on hypnotic anesthesia and analgesia for testicular tumors, I'd probably say no. Probably say no. There you go. <laughs> or the amazing scientific credibility of Anton Mesmer. Friends, <laughs> oh, shut you. up. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't teach that. Yeah, I'd just go. say no. I wouldn't do it. Exactly. Now, it's time for you, Chris, to give the empowering question. All right. Let's do the empowering question for 249, right? Episode 249, this was. Can't even keep track. I think it is. I think it is. Here's your empowering question. What have I learned today, and what will I apply from what I've learned so that I embody a truly powerful, congruent communicator? Yes. That's right. And I've got a metaphor for you, which is one better than a metaphor. This hat I'm wearing, it was originally my Brian Johnson ACDC cap because it's the same style. It's it's a newsboy cap Mm -hmm. because the newsboys used to wear their dad's caps and they were too big. And so it became a style statement. So it is now, of course, a Peaky Blinders style. And I keep a razor blade just (laughs) under the edge here just in case you have to blind somebody. Kidding. Don't don't email me because I won't read it. Now, the interesting thing about this is Heather and I were in New York City with some of her brothers and some family uh, for a big event. 
a number of years ago, we went to the top of the Rockefeller Center and I was wearing a beautiful Collihan coat that I now wear to do the gardening because it's fallen apart many, many years later. Yep. I was wearing this hat and I also have, I got a beautiful black and white rock and roll damnation ACDC scarf around my neck. And we're at the top of the Rockefeller Center looking at New York City. And these two young guys keep looking over at us, keep looking over. Finally, they come over. One, they're Russian. And the one says, excuse me, are you the lead vocalist of the band ACDC? <laughs> well, naturally, I was offended and, and greatly. <laughs> I, mean, I was thrilled. I was thrilled. I said, no, I'm not. I don't think he even believed me. And I said to Heather, he thought I was Brian Johnson. And she said, well, that's nice. I said, Brian Johnson is an old guy with a big nose. And she went, mm-hmm. Touche. This has been Brain Software episode 249, all about becoming an awesome and effective communicator in a wide variety of situations, yeah. contexts, performances, stages, Shut her down. social situations. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you check out MikeMandelHypnosis.com. You can check out our events. You can check out the free resources that we have. You can subscribe to this podcast, whether you're listening to the audio. We appreciate it if you do. Or if you're on YouTube and you're watching the video version, please hit that subscribe button. Drop us a comment. You can email us if you want. We do read our own emails and we reply to a lot of them. And we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks once again. And... Good, Good night. night.